Hello, my name is Tom Brand. Thank you very much for inviting me to give this lecture at the Westminster Presbyterian Theological Seminary. Um, I'm the Ministry Director for the Evangelical Fellowship of Congregational Churches, um, which is a group of just over 100 churches in England, Wales uh, and in Northern Ireland. Um, we're congregational and um, historically um, quite similar to Presbyterian churches. I myself am a Presbyterian, um, so it's great to be able to to give this lecture today. Um, I wanted just to spend 30 seconds telling you about the EFCC and then read from the scriptures uh, and then begin uh, this lecture. Um, the EFCC has been going for um, just over 50 years. Um, it's a group of just over 100 churches, um, as I mentioned. And our, our vision statement is exalting Christ in growing healthy churches. At the moment, we're focusing on um, placing pastors in our churches. Um, we've got about a quarter of our churches with no pastors, uh, and it's been really exciting having a few um, new placements recently, which has been great. And the other aspect of our major focus um, is replanting works. Um, some of our churches have been very small and struggling, uh, so we're linking them with larger churches um, uh, for, uh, so we can engage them in replanting works so that the gospel can thrive and flourish again in those communities. Let me read to you a few verses from uh, the scriptures. The title of my paper today is A Theological Trend Towards Divine Passibility. I'm going to be arguing uh, for divine impassibility. That is the historic doctrine that God cannot suffer. Um, but I'm going to look at the way in um, theology at the moment. Um, it is much more popular and common to see people espousing divine passibility. That is the doctrine that God can suffer. First of all, a few verses. First of all, um, in the book of Exodus, the well-known uh, passage that supports the doctrine of divine impassibility uh, and much more uh, that links to what I'll be saying later. Exodus chapter 3, verse 14. God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, thus you shall say to the sons of Israel, I am has sent me to you. Then moving to right to the end of the Old Testament, in the book of Malachi, in chapter 3 and verse 6, it says this, For I, the Lord, do not change. Therefore you, O sons of Jacob, are not consumed. And then the final verse uh, of this collection of three verses um, in the book of James in the New Testament, chapter 1, and uh, verse 16 and verse 17. Do not be deceived, my beloved brethren. Every good thing given and every perfect gift is from above coming down from the father of lights with whom there is no variation or shifting shadow the theological trends towards divine passibility in general the patristic and scholastic doctrine of god holds very clearly that the divine nature is immutable and impassable because god is simple this was historically considered to be the orthodox and confessional position very, very clearly. In the Council of Nicaea in 325, um, it anathematized those who would attribute alteration, change, to the person of God the Son. In the French Reformed Confession of Faith, uh, de la Rochelle, um, with which Calvin was involved, the first article mentions the divine attribute of immutability, that God is unchanging. Impassibility, God is, does not suffer, is also attributed to God in the second chapter of the Westminster Confession of Faith in 1647, which states that God is without body, parts or passions. That exact phrase appears in the 42 articles of 1552, in the 39 articles of the Church of England in 1563, in the Irish Articles of 1615, in the Savoy Declaration of 1658 and the second London Confession of Faith in 1677 and again in 89. The proposition that God is without parts means that God is non-composite. He is not composed because he is simple. The uniform acceptance of doctrines of divine immutability and impassibility um, is demonstrably clear from creedal and confessional material. But from the last half of the 19th century, the do doctrine of divine impassibility began to be questioned and contested within um, the Orthodox tradition. The historical shift focused primarily on divine impassibility uh, and a man called I, Isaac August Dorner, um, who wrote this book um, on divine immutability, 
a critical reconsideration, um, he begins to argue that God being unchanging is with reference to his character and his faithfulness and no longer with reference to his nature. So the historical position would be that God is unchanging in his nature. But Isaac August Dorner um, in the last half of the uh, 19th century from 1856 to 58, when it was first published, began to argue that God's nature, God's character, his faithfulness does not change. As we look into this, I want first of all just to outline a bit about the divine nature itself, um, and then um, to focusing especially on the doctrines of simplicity and impassibility. And then we're going to look at this trend towards passibility, uh, and we're going to focus on Hegel, and then on a historic thread um, of passibilist theologians, or these so-called passibilist theologians, um, and then look at this major paradigm shift that has happened from the end of the um, 19th century, um, and looking at Isaac August Dorner. First of all, then, the divine nature. It is what makes God God. It is the quiddity, the whatness of God. The scriptures speak of God's nature uh, in reference to the godness of God. If you think about passages like Romans 1.20, James Dolezal comments on this verse, and he says, there is something that we call divinity by which God is divine and which is the foundation for his acts of creation, the godness of God, so to speak. The divine essence exists in three persons. The divine essence itself is indivisible, and therefore the three persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, are not separate portions of the divine essence. Instead, they are subsistences of the one indivisible divine essence. Divine simplicity then logically grounds immutability, which in turn grounds divine impassibility. In other words, if God is simple without parts, then he must be unchanging. In turn, he must also be impassable. We'll look at um, some questions about that in a moment. Within divine nature, we started then with simplicity. The divine essence is simple. It is not composite. It is not compounded in any way, neither physically, metaphysically, nor logically. God is free of any kind of composition, whether that be potentiality and actuality composition, whether it be matter and form composition, whether it be existence and essence composition, um, in every way, God is simple and is not composed of parts. I was talking to uh, my wife the other day and we were talking about that. And she uh, referred to a wonderful comment that says that if God is simple, he cannot fall apart. That is so encouraging, so good. God doesn't fall apart in bad situations because he has no parts. He is simple. He is not composed. The doctrine of divine simplicity is expressed by Aquinas, Thomas Aquinas, by stating that God is being itself and therefore pure actuality. That is, God is pure actuality, possessing no potential. He has no potential in any way. He is totally in act. The doctrine that God is pure actuality, actus purus, is upheld in the Reformed tradition very clearly. The Westminster divine Francis Schenel links the doctrine of necessity, that is, God exists necessarily, with the doctrine that God is pure actuality and the doctrine of divine simplicity. He links those core truths of theology proper to Exodus 3.14, the passage we read at the beginning. And Shainal says this, it is utterly impossible that God should not exist because the divine nature is a pure act, an absolute, necessary, eternal, infinite, independent, single being. For it is manifestly absurd to conceive this pure infinite and eternal being not to be in act, since it is a pure act. God doth declare the incomprehensible purity of his infinite and single being in that amazing and yet edifying text, I am that I am, as if he had said, there is nothing in your God which is not God. My attributes do not differ from myself. My being is absolutely necessary, every way perfect, altogether pure, single and infinite. It's a brilliant quote from one of the Westminster divines. And Thomas Aquinas argues that in a first cause of motion, if it is altogether immovable, there cannot be potentiality 
with actuality. For a thing is movable because it has potential. God in himself, as Shainal has said, and as the historic doctrine of divine immutability states clearly, God is both essentially and personally, absolutely and eternally perfect. He cannot be better than he is. The classical formulation of divine simplicity also says that God is free of existence, essence, composition, and that therefore God is identical to his existence. And that leads into incredibly complicated uh, philosophical discussion that we don't have time for today, and there's lots and lots of extensive literature on that. But suffice it to say that in the Reformed tradition, it's very clear that God is identical with each of his attributes. Therefore, the, divine, the doctrine of divine simplicity stops us theologically from saying that God exists and he has this and that attribute, like goodness and justice. What are commonly called attributes of God cannot be separated or abstracted from the divine essence because God is simple. Regarding divine impassibility and divine simplicity, um, it entails that God is impassible not because God instantiates the property of being impassible, because this would imply a real distinction between God and this property. Instead, God is impassible because God is impassibility itself, in much the same way that we say that God is light and God is good. We don't say that God is, exists and he has this property of goodness. We say that God is good and that God is love. Let's look then at this stacking um, of doctrines from divine simplicity to divine immutability and then divine impassibility. If God is simple and free from all composition, that is the doctrine of divine simplicity, then divine immutability, God is unchanging, is entailed. The scriptures are clear and we read some of the passages earlier, although they're variously interpreted. The relationship between divine simplicity, immutability and impassibility is complex. And it's made more obscure because lots of the literature on these issues don't sufficiently define um, with sufficient precision what they mean by these terms. This is particularly the case with divine impassibility. And there's a really helpful book by um, Richard Creel, an essay on divine impassibility that deals with all the different permutations of what different theologians mean by impassibility and how it links to immutability and simplicity. The proposition that Divine simplicity entails immutability, which entails impassibility, is widely accepted in the literature, but is not necessary. Um, it not, doesn't necessarily point to impassibility in God's will and his knowledge and his emotion. The distinction between immutability and impassibility can be very easily blurred. Divine immutability does not necessarily imply impassibility. But if we break that entailment connection, it leads to a very confused and certainly heterodox view of God. For example, a being could be impassible, not suffering, but mutable, changing, if such a being could change itself, but was impervious to external causal influence. At the other end of the spectrum, um, conversely, it's conceivable that God could be mutable, changing, I'm sorry, that, that God could be immutable, unchanging, but passable. For example, a being that was changelessly grieved by a sin. Richard Creel, in the book I mentioned um, on impassibility, uh, opens up this, this discourse in a really, really helpful way. It gets very complicated. The description of God as impassable in um, Aquinas and in the Reformed sense has been objected to very strongly in recent literature especially um, focusing in a popular level um, on the writings of Jürgen Moltmann, who argues that God, if he were immutable in the reformed sense, would be static and stagnant and inert like a rock who cannot possibly help us. Moltmann claims that the biblical God is not revealed to us in these terms, and that's a profound challenge, and that therefore God is neither immutable nor impassable. But the criticism that an immutable God is inert or static, fails to understand the beauty of the Reformed description of God in these terms, that God is actus purus, i.e. that God is 
is pure actuality. I respond to Maltman's criticism, um, that saying that if God is pure actuality, then he must be static in an, and inert, by saying again very clearly that the um, immutability of God and the doctrine that he is pure actuality is very clearly laid out in the historic confessions and has only recently um, been challenged. And we can argue against it very clearly in, in two ways. Firstly, at the most basic level, if God is not pure actuality, but if God has potential, as the philosopher Hegel and as Maltman very clearly claim, then God must lack a perfection, namely the perfection of perfect being. If God has potential, then necessarily he could be better than he is in some way in his being in itself ad intra. This is surely totally unacceptable, even to the pacifist. Specifically, if God is becoming rather than being, then he cannot be being in itself, and therefore he cannot be self-sufficient. And so the claim in Exodus 3.14, I am that I am, doesn't mean anything. The second line of argument, that inertia and stagnation are the very opposite of correct descriptions of God um, as actus purius, Passibilists such as, as Maltman understand this doctrine that God is pure actuality and immutable. They understand this doctrine to mean that God is unchanging, like a rock, static and unfeeling, and unable therefore to help us. But this is a wrong interpretation of the Thomistic doctrine. If God is pure actuality, then he possesses no potential to be more than what he already is. The scriptures reveal God to be love. Therefore, God has no potential to be more love, more loving than he is. It's not the case that he is static and immovable in his love, but instead quite the opposite is true. God is perfect love. He could not be more love. He is love fully in act, with no potential to be more love or to be more loving than he is. The doctrine that God is pure actuality when properly understood, indicates that God is dynamic in the fullest possible sense, rather than static. All that God is, he could not be to a lesser or greater extent. Therefore, the knowledge from scriptures that God loves us, God, because he is perfect act, could not love us more because he is love. Let's turn then to look at this trend in the last century and um, from the end of the 19th century uh, towards divine passibility. The theological trends um, towards divine passibility from the end of the 19th century continues to be very influential in contemporary discussions of the divine essence, partly because of the huge influence of theologians like Jürgen Moltmann. Contemporary rejections of divine impassibility are more and more common. In fact, it's almost pejorative to state that someone believes in divine impassibility or, um, or immutability. I'm going to offer a very brief survey um, of the conceptual background uh, and the three main trajectories that can be traced in order to more fully understand um, this theological development in its context historically. First of all, we're going to look a little bit at um, GWF Hegel, and then at a thread um, historically of individual theologians from the patristic and reformed eras who seems to adhere to divine passibility, and then to look uh, at a response um, to the huge public awareness of suffering and the way this led to a doctrine of divine passibility. First of all, then, George Wilhelm Frederick Hegel um, died in 1831. Um, and first of all, the philosophy of Hegel has hugely influenced Christian theology to the detriment of the doctrine of divine impassibility. In general, Trinitarian theology was not central um, in the theological landscape in the 18th century, and this marginalization of Trinitarian theology became very prominent and very clear as a result of the writings of Immanuel Kant, um, the philosopher. Um, Kant argues that possible human judgments and knowledge and cognition and limited to sense experience um, with reference to 12 categories, which are kind of like a, a framework, a scaffolding 
a conceptual scaffolding through which we interpret the sense experience in the world around us. If human judgments and concepts and cognition are limited to sense experience through these categories, as Kant argues, then human judgments are limited to what we can perceive with our senses. That automatically, according to Kant, excludes God, um, who is beyond sense perception. In his work, Religion Within the Bounds of Reason Alone, Kant argues that the doctrine of the Trinity is ultimately incomprehensible because it, it lies beyond the comprehension of human cognition. The implication of Kant's assertion are worked out more fully in his book, The Conflict of the Faculties, uh, in which he claims that the doctrine of the Trinity, and this is a quote from Kant, has no practical relevance at all, even if we think we understand it, and if it is even more clearly, uh, sorry, and it is even more clearly irrelevant if we realise that it transcends all our concepts. Kant claims that the plural number of uh, hypostases, the, the persons in the Godhead, is not comprehensible in one God, and it makes, he quotes again, no difference in his rules of conduct. The impact of Kant's epistemology on subsequent philosophy and theology, um, and in Christology in particular, is immense. And Hegel picked up where Kant left off. He tried to respond to Kant to, in order, by trying to re-centralise the doctrine of the Trinity, which he considers to be a weighty Christian doctrine. In Hegel, the doctrine of the Trinity is partly reclaimed from Kantian epistemology, and he tries to re-centralise it again in theology. But Hegel's uh, Trinitarian theology is very clearly modalistic. God exists, uh, and he has these modes of being as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. He is heterodox, he's not orthodox in his Trinitarian theology. Hegel's philosophy of religion begins with God, um, and he roots his doctrine of God in his understanding of logic, which Hegel bases on his understanding of syllogisms, um, which we'll mention uh, uh, as, as we come to it. Um, as we look at a syllogism, we think of the kind of famous syllogisms like um, all men are mortal, that's premise one, and premise two, Socrates was a man. Then the conclusion from premise one and two, Socrates was mortal. We have the universal statement at the beginning, all men are mortal. Then the particular statement, the second premise, Socrates is a man. And then the conclusion of singularity, which combines the first and second premise, Socrates is therefore mortal. Hegel takes these three points of the Aristotelian syllogism, universality, particularity, and singularity, and he uses them as a grid for understanding the theology and the doctrine of God. He argues that universality, which would be premise one, um, is God before creation, God in himself. That is the general statement, God exists. Then premise two, Maltman uh, maps theology onto it by speaking of God creating the universe. We have premise one, God exists. Premise two, God creates, and there is a creation. And that automatically in Hegel's philosophy entails a separation there is a separateness from God and creation. And then the conclusion of the syllogism um, in Hegel's philosophy is singularity. That is a reconciliation between God and creation. And as Hegel argues, in order for that to happen, God has to become part of history. He has to live in history. In order to be reconciled to his creation, God has to become part of it in a process, in becoming, by having potential. Hegel's discussion of the incarnation and the death of Christ treats the divine essence of God as the essential moment. And it's hugely significant for, for this paper that Hegel quotes a Lutheran hymn in his assertion, God himself is dead. When Hegel writes about the cross of Christ, he quotes Luther um, with affirmation, uh, saying that God himself on the cross is dead. Hegel expounds this by arguing that the weakness, finitude and frailty, and most importantly, the negative in Christ's death, become moments in God himself. Hegel claims, and I quote, that finitude, negativity, otherness are not outside of God in this way. What is external and negative 
is converted into the internal. Death itself is this negative, the furthest extreme to which humanity as natural existence is exposed. God himself is involved in this death. In the phenomenology of spirit and one of Hegel's uh, lectures and his works, Hegel gives greater emphasis to this dialectic movement and the death of the divine man as death is abstract negativity and the immediate result, Hegel says, of the movement which ends only in natural universality. That's again a quote from Hegel. So Hegel, from his conception of the syllogism and this movement of God from being existence to being reconciled to humanity through a process of becoming in history, Hegel says that the negative of death is a, mo a, mo a moment in God himself, only on the basis of his understanding of the doctrine of the Trinity, which he suggests has lost much public theological interest, although, as we said earlier, it is a weighty doctrine. For Hegel, the doctrine of the Trinity allows for otherness to be a moment in a divine life, because the three persons of the Trinity exist as one divine essence, while also being distinct persons. From this orthodox doctrine at the beginning of Hegel's theology, Hegel suggests that the creation and reconciliation are inevitable, and that the process of, of reconciliation through this process, death and history and becoming and process become part of God. God enters into human history by becoming part of it. Hegel's understanding of finitude and weakness and death as dialectical moments in the history of God as Trinity has a huge influence, um, especially on Jürgen Moltmann, um, on Jungel, um, and on Rana, among other theologians. And I argue that Hegel's influence on Moltmann and Moltmann's influence on contemporary theology is one of the main causes of this movement, uh, even in, in Christian, uh, even in evangelical writings about the doctrine of God. The point at which Moltmann's dependence on Hegel is most clear comes uh, in his writing on the cross um, in The Crucified God. Moltmann writes, if one describes the life of God within the Trinity as the history of God, this history of God contains within itself a whole abyss of God forsakenness, absolute death and the non-God, because this death took place in the history between father and son on the cross on Golgotha, the concrete history of God in the death of Jesus on the cross on Golgotha, therefore contains within itself all the depths and abysses of human history, and therefore can be understood as the history of history. All human history, however much it may be determined by guilt and death, is taken up into the history of God, into the Trinity, and integrated into the future of the history of God. There is no suffering which in this history of God is not God's suffering, no death which has not been God's death in the history on Golgotha. Mortman, in characteristic way, uses strong language and, and provocative language, and often the strength of his, his writing can blind people to the fact that he is going in totally the opposite direction to historic orthodox statements of divine impassibility and the nature of God. Maltman depends, though, on Hegel's writing in his articulation of God's becoming uh, and death becoming a moment in God himself. The influence of Maltman's theology on the cross and the suffering of God is hugely significant. Maltman is frequently referred to as an important Protestant theologian um, who espouses divine passibility, and this is due on the one hand to his the sheer quantity of his writings on the subject, and the, on the other hand, as we mentioned, to the incisive and direct style of his writings. It, it grabs people, um, and he seems to be writing from within an orthodox, even reformed tradition at some points. We want to look now at this um, historical thread of theologians who speak about divine impassibility, divine passibility. From the Church Fathers, uh, Origen um, speaks in some places in a clearly passivist way of the Father and the Son. In his writings on Ezekiel, Origen says, and I quote, the Father himself and the God of the whole universe is long-suffering, full of mercy and pity. Must he not then in some sense be exposed to suffering? 
the father himself is not impassible. That seems clear that Origen is promoting divine passibility. But on the other hand, in his book uh, on first principles, um, one of his major uh, systematic or more systematic texts, rather than um, an exposition, Origen outlines a basic doctrine of divine simplicity, which is opposed to what he seems to be espousing elsewhere on divine passibility. Interestingly, Luther follows Origen's more passibilist statements in positing a passable God who suffers as God, not merely in the human flesh in the Incarnation. This is in part due to his employment, employment of the, communications, uh, the communication of idioms, um, in Lutheran theology, um, which seeks to argue that whatever is true of the human nature becomes true of the divine nature in the Lutheran sense, whereas the more orthodox reform sense argues that whatever is true of either nature, divine or human in Christ, must be predicated of the person who is God the Son. The quotes from these authors, um, from Luther uh, and then from Origen, um, especially Origen, can very easily be taken out of context. And to claim that Origen was a patristic uh, author akin to the statements that Maltman makes. However, this is an unmeasured conclusion. Um, it's typical, I find, of lots of evangelical writers who espouse divine passibility to pluck out these texts from the patristic authors, particularly Origen, um, and say, look, Origen is a passivalist theologian, therefore I have patristic precedent in stating that God is passable. But instead, we need to read, especially the patristics, in context um, and more broadly uh, in their theological writings and see that we can't simply understand Origen as a passivist. Um, instead, we have to see that he states very clearly that God does not suffer. We need to understand the context of his writings. We see then this huge paradigm and shift um, in theology, um, starting in the late, uh, or halfway through in the late 19th century, um, from writers like Isaac August Dorner um, in his book on divine immutability. Um, and then we see um, the Industrial Revolution taking hold of Europe. Um, and then we see World War I and World War II happening. As a result of these three public, um, destructive and uh, culturally sort of disruptive uh, events, we see, as uh, B. R. Brasnett states in 1928, that he quotes, "Man, uh, men feel, and perhaps will increasingly feel, that a God who is not passable, who is exempt from pain or suffering, is a God of little value to humanity." The passivists, as a result of the public exposure, exposure to great suffering in the Industrial Revolution and the Great Wars, the passivist argues that humans have responded to this suffering by demanding that God himself must be able to suffer in order to relate to us in our human condition. If God could suffer then, the protest atheism which Maltman equates with Camus um, could potentially be avoided, uh, and Maltman's startling theological response um, to the writings of E. Uh, Weisel in his account of a prolonged hanging um, in the concentration camp in Auschwitz um, in his book on the night, um, it gave this kind of visceral response against the impassibilist doctrine of reformed orthodoxy and instead argues very powerfully that we must have a suffering God. Um, Weisel, uh, as I mentioned um, in his book, The Night, um, he says very clearly that when, when he, he gives this account um, of a youth hanging on the gallows uh, and the prisoners being forced to watch this boy hanging, um, and it was a prolonged hanging that, that, that did not go well. Um, and the boy was in agony for some time. And one of the people on, on this stand uh, watching the hanging cried out uh, in anguish, where is God? Where is God? And Weissel uh, recalls hearing a voice behind him saying, there he is. He is there. He is that boy hanging on the gallows. Mortman responds to this visceral, visceral statement by saying any other answer would be blasphemy. There cannot be any other Christian answer to the question of this torment. To speak here of a God who could not suffer would make God a demon. To speak here of an absolute God would make God an annihilating nothingness. To speak here of an indifferent God would condemn men to indifference. Maltland consistently sounds 
This note throughout his theological writings as he assumes that an impassable God must be indifferent to human suffering. The influence from Hegel, this slender historical thread of theologians, and a social and historical developments um, since the 1890s constitute this threefold historical background to the contemporary move towards a doctrine of divine passivity that God can suffer. This historical overview, albeit very brief, um, provides the background for understanding the doctrine of divine simplicity, divine immutability and divine impassibility, which um, we've explored uh, at the beginning of the paper in the first half. The doctrine of divine simplicity is this great foundation. When we have that correctly understood, it leads to a right understanding of divine immutability and a right understanding of divine impassibility that God cannot suffer. But as we've seen clearly, divine impassibility and divine immutability, they do not mean that God is inert or static or irrelevant. Instead, it means that God could not be more, could not be better, could not improve in any way. He has perfect actuality. He could not be more love, more God, more good, more divine, more wonderful than he is. The overwhelming historical consensus um, back to the apostles and throughout the patristic and scholastic and the reformation eras um, of Christianity is abundantly clear that God is simple, that God is without parts, that the divine nature is unchanging, that it cannot suffer, that it is impassable. But from the last decades of the 19th century, British theologians began to question the doctrine of divine impassibility. And this has escalated to the point that it's currently a commonplace in theology, even in evangelical circles, to reject divine impassibility. But the rejection of impassibility is usually coupled with the view that the doctrine of divine simplicity is archaic and unbiblical. And it's very interesting to note, um, by way of conclusion, that the theologians who reject divine simplicity and impassibility within the evangelical tradition are usually the ones who also question and reject the historic orthodox statements on the doctrine of the Trinity and question other um, very fundamental issues on the aseity of the Son, um, on the eternal generation of the Son, uh, and that leads to great confusion. As we make mistakes in the doctrine of God, if we make mistakes in the doctrine of the Trinity, then we will make mistakes in all branches of theology. Thank you very much. It's been a joy to be here today um, and to give this lecture. I thank you for your kind invitation.